London news agents. I think I counted almost 30 in the last year. Pensions, planning, peerages, public sector pay, tuition fees, childcare, second referendums, defining a woman. Although, although in fairness, that was only 99% of a U-turn. The, the list goes on, but the theme is the same, Mr Speaker. It's empty words, broken promises and absolutely no plan. Of all, of all the work, of all the weeks to say that, when Brianna's mother is in this chamber, shame, parading as a man of integrity when he's got absolutely no responsibility. This was a Prime Minister's questions like no other. I haven't actually seen Keir Starmer so visibly, angrily shocked in the house before as that moment where having welcomed the mother of the murdered teenager Brianna Jai he then heard from Sunak's lips a joke about trans people. At the time of recording Rishi Sunak and number 10 have refused to apologise just as he refused to apologise in the chamber despite several Labour MPs calling on him to do so. This is bigger than just what happened this afternoon, though. It is a reminder that the culture wars, for all of their froth and fury in Westminster, for all the fact that so many operatives in Westminster like to think that it's a smart political row to go down, it's a reminder that there are people at the heart of these stories, and that has been brutally illustrated in the House of Commons today. Welcome to the news agents. It's Lewis in Birmingham. And it's Emily at News Agents HQ. And um, Emily, are you on the 20 a day again or is your your voice playing you up, unfortunately? I'm, I'm fine, apart from my vocal cords, which have gone, um, disappeared. You can do the lion's share of the talking today. No but... difference there, I suppose. <laughs> Finally! <laughs> um, listen, we're going to be talking about what happened in Prime Minister's Questions PMQs today, we're going to be looking at it more widely in the context of an election year which already feels quite frenzied and politically unpleasant for all the reasons that Lewis has just laid out. And we're going to be asking a former permanent secretary, Lord Simon MacDonald, how he sees standards in public life going into the next six months. Well, we're of course going to start um, with that question of of standards in public life, which has been uh, illustrated so vividly in the House of Commons this afternoon. This, of course, concerns, if you haven't seen this story, you probably have, because it is so graphic, it is so gruesome. It concerns the murdered 16-year-old girl, Brianna Jai. Her killers were convicted on Friday last week. She was transgender. She was stabbed 28 times in her head, her neck and back with a hunting knife in Linear Park near Warrington. In the weeks before her murder, two 15-year-olds, who were only named last week, her friends exchanged thousands of texts and WhatsApp messages about how they were going to kill Brianna. It's a case which has shocked the country. And her mother, Esther, was in Parliament today in the House of Commons gallery watching Prime Minister's questions. And initially, Rishi Sunak addressed the fact that she was there and that horrible, terrible case. This is what he said. I could just say also to Brianna Gray's mum, who is here, as I've said earlier this week, what happened was an unspeakable and shocking tragedy, Mr Speaker. And as I said earlier this week, in the face of that, for her mother to demonstrate the compassion and empathy that she did last weekend, I thought demonstrated the very best of humanity in the face of seeing the very worst of humanity, and she deserves all our admiration and praise for that. He's referencing an interview that Brianna's mum, Esther, gave to the BBC at the weekend, in which she actually said she'd be happy to sit down with the mother, the mothers of the two murderers, and talk about what had gone wrong in their children's lives. She blames phones, she blames apps, she fain, she blames social media. But what came across in that interview was her enormous dignity, enormous courage, enormous 
I guess, resolve to find something positive from losing her child in such a horrific way. And we should say, perhaps, that we do not know how relevant her trans identity was to the murder. We know that one of the children was transphobic. We don't know if that was implicitly a part of the murder. And certainly it's not something that Esther Jai has, uh, if you like, fallen back on. And yet in this context of our two leaders, of the leader of the opposition, who had actually just moments before welcomed her, for Rishi Sunak to fall into this trap of making what we can only really call his usual weekly joke about what a woman is and why Keir Starmer can't make up his mind. Yeah, and what is so, um, I think, just really, really disappointing about all of this is that we heard Sunak say the right thing. We played that clip. OK, he didn't get Brianna Jai's pronunciation of her name completely right, but we'll leave that to one side by the by. He's got a lot as Prime Minister and a lot of names to remember. So he does the right thing. And then, as you say, Emily, as part of his rehearsed attack on Keir Starmer, which is about Keir Starmer being vacillating, about being all over the place, being a flip-flopper, perfectly legitimate to point out. And yet, This week of all weeks, he couldn't just have left off that last one, which was a joke about what a woman is. And yes, Number 10 are saying, this isn't a joke about trans people, it's a joke about Keir Starmer's vacillation. Really? You've got no end of things that you can make a joke about Keir Starmer vacillating on. Indeed, he made a pretty decent list. Did he really have to include this one this week? Because we all know that the heart of that joke about what a woman is is an overly simplistic kind of, it's not even a joke, just a stupid comment, which goes to the heart of a debate that we are having in society about what precisely gender is and how it relates to sex. And it's crass at the best of times, but at a time when he knows that the mother of a trans-murdered schoolgirl is in on the parliamentary estate, I think it's pretty unforgivable. Yeah, and I think, I mean, more broadly, I think, just to simplify things a bit, this is not really a gender-critical debate versus a gender-affirmative debate. It's about basic kindness totally. versus basic cruelty. So you can kind of leave all the unpackaging to one side and say, why would you choose that moment you know well the answer is because he does it so repeatedly but I think this goes to the heart of something which is about political nimbleness and okay maybe it's not the most important quality that a politician has to show but I think emotional intelligence really is and clearly I mean funny enough I was watching the whole exchange And my thoughts were, before that moment, were that Rishi Sunak seemed quite sort of, as David Cameron would have said, pumped up. He seemed quite energised and quite excitable and he was sort of smiley and he he found himself very fluent. And what it made me realise was that he'd got his lines right. He'd got his scripting right. He had delivered the things that his team and he had prepared. And there was, honestly... Nothing worse than not being able to react to the thing that is right in front of you, whether it's a driver on a busy road or whether it's a politician in a place where something incredibly moving has happened and you cannot make that gear change. And I think that's what we saw, not for the first time, from our Prime Minister, a man who is singularly unable to just shift into the right required emotional gear that it takes. Yeah, I think that's right. There are questions again about Sunak's political judgment, his emotional judgment, his political um, dexterity. I think there is also something slightly wider going on here as well, which is that, you know what's particularly sad about, about this is that it doesn't come out of nowhere. The truth is that if it hadn't been for the murder of Brianna Jai, and it hadn't been for the fact that Esther Jai was on the parliamentary estate when this happened, Westminster wouldn't have batted an eyelid. Sunak makes these gags all the time. Not just Sunak as well. Previous Conservative Prime Ministers and senior politicians make trans people, or at the very least, the really, really emotionally charged and delicate debate, which should exist, sensitive debate, 
around trans people and trans issues, because of course they're legitimate questions, but they make it the butt of the joke time after time about the precisely the sort of issue that should not be the butt of the joke, about which politicians should speak gently and unsensitively. I mean, you know, just to give you another example, I remember last year going to see a Suella Breverman speech. What did she say? She said that Keir Starmer might be Labour's first female prime minister. You know, all of this sort of stuff, it happens again and again and again. I think the extent to which trans issues and trans people have become the butt of a political joke in Westminster, a cheap shot, a cheap gag, speaks to a certain level, frankly, of transphobia, which has started to infect British political debate. And this should be a wake-up call, because wherever you stand on this issue, and as I say, there are legitimate questions, and that's absolutely fine, and those questions should be contested in a respectful manner. Wherever you stand, surely we can all agree that politicians ought to at least act responsibly with regards to it, and that there are plenty of other, plenty of other material that they can use and take up to make you know, pretty poor political jokes without going down this particular road. Well, I think what you're putting your finger on is the fact that the culture wars have been such delicious red meat for vast sections, actually, of those on the right, precisely because it allows people to reduce really complex arguments, really important discussions to for or against, with or without, hate or love. I mean, the asylum, I guess the asylum debate is another one in question where you again have, you know, Suella Bravman talking about her dream, you know, her dream to get rid of asylum seekers and put them on a plane to Rwanda. And even if this is something that many people want to see addressed as a problem in the country, illegal immigration that is, even if a lot of people are wanting to find a solution, somehow this reductive language, you know, they are something to be hated, you know, the National Trust has gone woke. Have these discussions in a more elegant, more intelligent way so that you bring people with them. They don't just become the butt of jokes. You know, is that really, is that really the kind of humour that the Conservative Party find funny? Because yeah. I don't believe it is, not for most MPs, not for most of those in, in the Conservative Party. I mean, there's loads of really decent, and we should reinforce this, really decent people on all sides of the House. And yet the culture wars make you choose sides in things that actually just require more time, more thought and more, more compassion. Well, the best thing for Sunak to have done would have been to very swiftly uh, apologise, just say... Uh, given the circumstances, that was uh, ill-judged, and I apologise. I was trying to draw attention to Keir Starmer's vacillation on all of these issues, but I accept that was uh, ill-judged, and it would have shut it down. Number 10 have, so far, as I say, at the time of recording, refused to do that. And I think it is not only a political misjudgment in one sense, which is it actually just alienates Sunak from precisely the cohort of MPs, i.e. the more moderate One Nation group, who, who don't have much time for these cultural war questions. They are his central plank, pillar of support. It alienates him from them. He doesn't win any friends from the right because, you know, as far as they're concerned, they loathe Sunak and this isn't going to uh, win any of them over. But also in terms of wider politics, I think this is one of those issues, one of those moments that could just ricochet and people really, the ordinary public, take notice of. The truth is, too clever by half, political strategists on the right of politics in particular at the Conservative Party, the top of the Conservative Party, have long sought and thought that the culture wars in an American style are something that really works with the British electorate. Mm -hmm. All of the evidence suggests that that is in fact not the case. Though the public may have some sense of, of some concern around some of the effects around the, the trans debate and in terms of some of the policy questions, there may be a little bit of concern here and there. Most people are actually pretty indifferent or oblivious to it. And one thing that the public really hate is callousness or cruelty or any <laughs> sense of simply being indifferent to someone's suffering. And if that is what they associate with Sunak on this, that is far more politically dangerous yeah. than any benefit or utility he gets from a cheap gag about an issue which actually deserves far, far greater sensitivity. You mentioned indifference, and I think that's really interesting because the week started um, with that one moment from the Piers Morgan interview 
where Rishi Sunak has seemed to be accepting a bet um, about whether he can get his asylum policy up and running uh, before the end of the parliament. And they shake hands. I'll bet you a thousand pounds to a refugee charity. You don't get anybody on those planes before the election. Will you take that bet? Well, I, well, I want to get the people on the planes, Pardon right? Sir? Of course I want to get the people on the plane. A thousand right? pounds. Right, I want to get the people on the plane. Now, when I watched that clip, I thought, OK, you know, here's a man. He hasn't really agreed to a bet. He hasn't really said yes. He looked like he was slightly dominated by Morgan's machismo, you yeah. know, I'm going to say. And a, a little bit of me sort of has this, you know, grudging respect, very begrudging, actually, of Piers Morgan for managing somehow to just sort of cavort with politicians until they're in this very squeamish position of having to sort of agree with what, you know, he's he's just laid down. And so I think you can buy the idea that Rishi Sunak was taken by surprise on the bet that was laid in front of him. I think what most people would never get over is that amount of money, you know, totally. a bet that could somehow be made without you noticing that involved a thousand pounds. And obviously, for Rishi Sunak, it can. Let's not pretend. You know, we understand that the sort of millions, indeed billions, that his family is worth, a thousand pounds doesn't even touch the sides. But I think, it, again, is sort of a recognition of just how immense that emotional gap is. Like most people, if you made a bet, I mean, I would never make a bet with Piers Morgan, but it probably wouldn't go above 40, 50 quid. Right. I mean, that would be something that I'd be really, really unhappy to pay out to Piers Morgan. I couldn't ever imagine making a thousand pound bet, least of all one that I hadn't even sort of properly signed up to. And so there is that sense of, you know, do we really want a prime minister who seems so startled by those moments and so sort of insouciant to the sums or to the people involved, I guess. I bet Piers Morgan a tenor that your voice wouldn't last the episode. <laughs> uh, but he said he didn't make bets that small, so so yeah. uh, we're, we're lost, unfortunately. I mean, yeah, you're so right about the money point. I mean, we should never forget that 80% of people in this country have less than 500 quid in their bank account. So, you know, the, when they see someone making a thousand pound bet, and I agree with you, it, it, he was just sort of, I mean, Sunak's quite an awkward character, right? And he, he felt, I think, slightly overwhelmed. He just saw this hand and he just took it. Just yeah. like overwhelmed. But if, you know, the, the rejoinder is, if you're overwhelmed by peers, like, you know, surely yeah. there are bigger. God, I mean, God help as you on as the peers international is, stage. Yeah. Well, 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 quite. But I think that was a little more explicable than this, because this is something they could row back on extremely quickly. And so far, they're choosing not to do so. And yeah. it's a, it is a mistake. Yeah. I mean, I think we can, you know, if you want to carry on the bet theme, we can have bets about whether or not the day will end up with an apology, because you can see how the only way Rishi Sunak recovers from this is to say, oh, for goodness sake, this was not about trans people. It was absolutely legitimate. It was absolutely about U-turns. You're trying to create trouble here by pretending it was transphobic when it wasn't. It was about Starmer. I think he will try and hold on to that argument for as long as he possibly can today. And my sense is, and I think we already know, that Esther Jai has asked to meet the Prime Minister I think face to face with a mother of a murdered teenager, I, I'm not sure that will last very long. Yeah, Esther Jai is now a very powerful woman in British politics because how she chooses to respond to this could be devastating for Sunak. And if I were in number 10, that's what I'd be worried about. Well, joining us now, Lord Simon MacDonald, a former permanent secretary, uh, a man who's certainly seen what it is like to lead and indeed to, to lead badly at times. Um, Simon, and I don't want to sort of push you into anywhere political, but I do want to talk a little bit about standards in public life, because that exchange in the Commons just now seemed to sort of indicate what could be ahead of us in this election year, where the sort of culture wars come to dominate just normal human discourse, actually. Well, a couple of points, Emily. Um, first, uh, everything I've seen about Rishi Sunak uh, tells me he's a decent person. Uh, but decent people have lapses, and I think he lapsed today. Uh, but the point about a lapse is that you recognise it, you apologise, and you don't do it again. So we'll see if that applies in this case. Uh, and on this issue, uh, it, it seems to me that trans should not be a political issue. In that, it shouldn't be party politically 
divisive. It's an issue for society. It's an issue about people who deserve to be treated with kindness and dignity like everybody else. Uh, and if we remember that, I think we'll have a, a more uh, positive conversation. I mean, I wonder whether you think, when you talk about lapses, it's not like he stumbled into making a trans joke for the first time. This has been part of his shtick, right? It's a pretty normal um, sort of linguistic behaviour in the Commons every single week. And I wonder if this is part of who you're trying to please, who he feels his constituency is now, and whether it is people who just love to hear the culture war stuff. I mean, the evidence is mounting. It feels to me something that he's taking on, that he's being advised to do. I, I, I don't get the feeling this comes from the centre of Rishi Sunak's person, but clearly the political handlers think that in an election year, these issues, this way of talking about these issues is electorally useful. And do you think it is? I mean, no. do you think? <laughs> no, I think that um, people uh, expect um, their leaders to treat everybody uh, with um, dignity and fairness. And almost by definition, the culture wars are trying to divide people from each other uh, in artificial, unhelpful ways. I guess every age thinks that integrity used to be greater in the one before, right? I mean, I'm sure that, you know, Reagan probably looks back to a time before where, where sort of politicians did things more honestly, whatever. But do you think we are into a place with rawer edges now? For sure. Um, and there are a number of contributory factors. Two of the most important for me are one, social media and the 24-hour news cycle. So politicians have to be on their game the whole time. There's no downtime. You're never, you're never able to disappear and recuperate. You're, you have to be on your game 24-7. Uh, but also related political careers are much more accelerated. Mm. Uh, in the old days, going back to before the Second World War and the first three decades after the Second World War, politicians served a political apprenticeship. They were ge generally a prime minister had been in parliament 30 years before she or he was prime minister. Generally, they'd done several cabinet jobs, including one of the great offices of state for some time. And then they emerged from among their colleagues as the top dog. In the last 20 years, it's become much quicker than that. So somebody like Rishi Sunak was only became an MP in 2015. So he's just appointed David Cameron as his foreign secretary. He and David Cameron hardly overlapped mm. in the Commons. They had only one year together. Uh, and yet um, that's not very far in the past. I guess... Tony Blair's an exception to that rule. Well, in that, I mean, he was in he was in from eighty three, but he, you know, famously only had one job in in government, which was you know three time elected prime minister. But that's a function of a long period in opposition, uh, and uh, if that's unavoidable. But that's a very particular circumstance. Uh, but when you look at the career of, of Rishi Sunak and, and Liz Truss and Boris Johnson and indeed David Cameron, things, e even whilst their party has been in power, they had whooshed through the system. OK, let's let's deal with Boris Johnson for a second, because your interjection uh, sort of is one of those. I remember where I was when um, you were on the Today programme on the BBC calling out Boris Johnson, frankly, for telling a lie about what he did or didn't know in the Chris Pincher affair. And essentially that that rumbled him, that brought him down. Do you think that uh, subsequent leaders have taken a leaf out of his book and decided that the no explanation, no apology stance works, that that's what is needed now? You know, we've seen Rishi saying... It was completely legitimate what I said in the Commons today. I'm not going to go and apologise. Has that now been passed down as the way to survive politically? People are more brazen, but uh, it wasn't invented uh, by Boris Johnson. Um, uh, I think the Duke of Wellington was the one who said, publish and be damned. You yeah. know, people have had that, so what, I'm just going to hang tough attitude for 
a very long time, but it now seems to be the default position that if you say something enough times, it becomes a fact uh, and you're happy to repeat it. And we have another example right now with the safety of Rwanda bill, where the government asserts uh, that Rwanda is a safe country and the British courts have to treat it as a safe country, no matter any evidence to the contrary, because a law of parliament will require British courts to behave as though that is a fact. And British courts can't do that, you'll tell me. British courts should not be asked to do that, but if it is the law of the land, British courts in the end will have no choice because it will be British law. In my view, it would be very bad British law. It would set a, a very bad precedent. Um, the idea that legislation can determine facts is uh, something new in our politics and wrong. But we could end up with a bill that has, in your words, created its own reality, insisted that Rwanda is a safe country, and that could get through the courts, right? Correct. I mean, that's astonishing, right, that the Prime Minister could say, I'm now going to deem Rwanda a safe country, and my bill has passed because the will of Parliament is more important than the rule of law. Correct. But he... It's... it's it's deciding everything. It's closing off all other avenues. Rwanda is a remarkable country. There are many good things that are happening in Rwanda. But Rwanda has no experience of operating uh, a system but for refugees. I guess I just want to bring you back to that, the, the theory of that, which is that, because we're seeing it now in the kind of talk that's coming out of the transition team for a potential second term of Trump, which is, you know, I think they call it Project 25, giving the executive more power. So if the executive decides that the Department of Justice is doing things wrong, then it sort of takes control over that. If the executive decides that civil servants are unelected bureaucrats or even security services are unelected bureaucrats, it gets rid of that. Are we starting to import something that looks like that here? That we are saying that the executive should have more power than the any other bodies. part of the government. Um, it's the executive with a majority in the House of Commons. Uh, and the executive, in the end, is dependent on that majority. But what we're seeing is um, uh, Lord Hailsham's nightmare, if you like, of an elected dictatorship. And this was the theme of um, Ken Clark's speech at second reading that on well, the, the government Rwanda on the Rwanda bill that the government is trying to upset the constitutional settlement in the UK to tilt things decisively uh, in favour of the government. Uh, so to reduce uh, the role, in particular here, of the courts by reducing the discretion of the courts. Uh, but also um, railroading things through Parliament, you know, not taking any amendments, no matter how reasonable, uh, from anybody outside the government. So, I mean, what do you hear when you've got, for example, you know, former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party saying, you know, sort of to hell with the rule of law, we have to make the rules? That is wrong. We are a country of law. We are nothing if we are not a country of law. Uh, and when a government might think it suits its short-term interests to override the rule of law, but all governments should have in mind the possibility, the, the fact that one day they won't be in power and they wouldn't like their replacement doing something similar to them. That ability to imagine someone else in charge, to imagine how others would use the power you are giving yourself is very important for a, a successful politician. The current Prime Minister lost out uh, in an election amongst his own party to Liz Truss, um, who is now back with a vengeance, the Popcons, uh, what do you think that they are aiming to do here? When you see um, the sort of ideology that's coming out now, and I guess I, I do connect it with what I think I'm seeing in America as well, which is very much this sort of, you know, need to reinforce the power of the executive, need to 
sort of, again, minimise what they would call unelected quangos. I guess that's you, it's civil servants. I mean, what, what does that language say to you? Whoever is in charge thinking they should be in charge of absolutely everything, which traditionally has not been the case. There has been space uh, for other views. Uh, there have been appointments, important uh, appointments in public life that have continued even when there's been a change of government. Uh, now there's a feeling that uh, when there's a change of government, everything that matters will change at the same time. I mean, what's that is new and I think a backward step. You lose experience, you lose continuity, you lose a breadth of understanding if the people in charge are in charge of everything and they appoint only people like themselves. You will you know, still be talking to colleagues in the civil service now who hear themselves repeatedly, I guess, sort of dragged through the mud for being, you know, on the wrong side of the government or, or you know, frustrating the will or, or not doing, the, as it were, populist rhetoric here, the people's bidding. What, what's it like to work there when, when that's the sort of language coming out? The key to understand is that governments, ministers take the decisions. The civil servants are their implementers. They advise, um, they try to shape decisions, uh, they, but most of all, they are there to implement them. So if they go wrong, it is the politician that, in my view, should carry the can. Traditionally, they did carry the can. The idea that civil servants uh, take, uh, take the fall is relatively new. I mean, Gavin Williamson overseeing a disastrous set of A-levels and staying in place whilst his permanent secretary walked mm. was something new. Uh, did you hear Ed Davey, the leader of the Lib Dems, this morning? I did not. So Ed Davey, who has been on the rack over the position he did or didn't take on, on the post office scandal, said that he was advised by officers in the business department that he should meet with Alan Bates for sort of publicity's sake, to do the right thing, but should be very careful not to commit to making any compromises. Listening to that, I thought, yeah, you were badly advised. You know, that was bad advice. Do you hear that and say, well, you were still the minister. You, you, you could have used your own instincts on this. He was the minister. It was his decision. Uh, advisers go so far, but um, uh, for the, uh, an ex-minister to imply that the advisers were taking the decision, I think, is wrong. And I think it is also significant that um, Sir Ed can say what he likes and civil servants can't say anything uh, to counter that because that bit of the old understanding is still in place. So he can say what he likes, safe in the knowledge that it won't be challenged by a serving civil servant. I guess that you can't have it both ways. You can't say, oh, you know, the civil servants are always getting overridden by ministers, you know, even when we're offering good advice. No, I'm not saying overridden. I'm saying that whatever <coughs> the advice is, it is the minister at the end who takes the decision. And it's uh, decisions are often but is it uh, hard to go against or a mosaic. You take a bit here harder. and a bit there. But isn't it hard to go against somebody who's advising you, who's saying, for goodness sake, you know, Mr. Davy, Sir Ed, don't make that mistake. We don't want you to get into deep, deep water yeah. over this. No? I mean, I work with many ministers, the best of them are able to have a comprehensive, detailed conversation with their civil servants before they, the ministers, make up their minds. Uh, and they want that because they want to take as good a decision as possible. And they know that they are the person, if they're good, who's going to have to uh, be held accountable. Mm -hmm. uh, and over my career, most of the ministers I work with worked on that basis. I want just to turn your thoughts to what's going on in America. Somehow this time, it's not just America's election, is it? It's going to affect all of us. If if Trump is re-elected, then that is going to have presumably a massive impact on what happens with NATO, what happens with Russia, what happens with Putin, Ukraine, the Middle East and further afield. He has just come through a court case which has taken away any chance of his immunity. We could be facing the spectre of a convicted criminal, potentially, taking the nomination for the Republican Party, and a man who sounds in recent 
clips and sound bites and interviews like he is losing his faculties in Joe Biden. It is the most consequential American election in my lifetime. Um, yes, the, both the candidates, or both the apparent uh, candidates, uh, are flawed for sure. Uh, I mean, flawed doesn't even. But come one close, of them is it? very significantly more flawed than the other. And I think, from our point of view, Donald Trump is an enormous worry. As you say, we don't have any role in this. The American people will choose their president. Uh, but it's not only NATO and Ukraine and China policy, it's also environmental policy, one of the most important challenges facing the world right now. And he is in a completely different place because of his energy policy, which he summarizes in three words, drill, baby, drill. And so in everything we care about is going to be in flux uh, and looking worse. And where does that leave the Conservatives here? We've already seen Boris Johnson saying we should welcome uh, a second Trump presidency. We've seen Jacob Rees-Mogg saying pretty similar lines that he'd be more favourable to the UK. I mean, do you think the Conservative Party is positioning itself to, to welcome in Donald Trump again? Some Conservatives are. I think some are trying to position themselves to influence Donald Trump. Uh, that Donald Trump is not someone who listens to people who oppose him. And so if you're Boris Johnson and you want Donald Trump to adopt your Ukraine policy, which mm. is very different from where Donald Trump is right now, then, then you're nice about Donald the, Trump. The opposite so I, to, to I where... kind of understand the politics. This but... is the opposite to where David Cameron was in 2016. Correct. Just before the Brexit vote, obviously he was still in power, before the November election of Donald Trump. He didn't want any of his ministers meeting right? or uh, the British ambassador or anybody working in the British embassy. Why? That decision was taken early in 2016 when Trump looked like a, a, a marginal candidate. You know, there was a very, a very big field. He was a very different sort of candidate from anybody else. And nobody could imagine, even in the election year, that uh, Donald Trump would emerge not only as the nominee, but as president elect. Um, uh, things have moved very rapidly since then. Um, and Donald Trump Mark II would be much more confident entering office. He knows much better how the system works. He knows how much inertia there is in the system. And it feels as though his uh, counter to that is to smash the system, to sack a lot of people, to tear up a lot of regulation and see what happens. Lord McDonnell, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Emily. Well, before we go, just a bit of breaking news from the world's most powerful leader. There is some movement, and I don't want to, I don't want to, well, maybe choose my words. There's some movement, there's been a response from the, uh, the, the there's been a response from the opposition, but um, it, it, yes, I'm sorry, from Hamas, but it seems to be uh, a little over the top. We're not sure where it is. There's a continuing negotiation right now. Are you still with us, listeners? Have you nodded off? Has he nodded off, the leader of the free world there, trying to bring us up to date with a really vital part of a solution to the Middle East right now. And nobody understands what he was saying. It's not ideal, is it? It's not completely ideal. He also confused um, President Macron with Francois Mitterrand. Right, right, right after I was elected, I went to a, what they call a G7 meeting, all the NATO leaders. And it, was in, it was in the south of England. And I sat down and I said, America's back. And Mitterrand from Germany, I mean, from France, looked at me and said, uh, said, you know, what, why, how, how long are you back? President Mitterrand, of course, who died in 1996. Um, so big news to Macron, I suppose. Um, Biden is, I mean, the, the, the unfortunate, the sad truth about about Biden is I was watching a clip of him in a speech he made in the summer of 20, uh, 2020. So he was running for president then. 
And even within the last three years or so, he, I think, has visibly, physically, cognitively is, is harder to tell, but certainly physically declined. I couldn't, he was bounding across the sort of boardwalk where this speech was. Hard to imagine him doing that now. And it is just playing more and more into this sense that Biden was the only guy who could beat Trump in 2020. Is he now the only Democrat who might lose to him in 2024? It is an extraordinary thing. Just last night, we were told that Donald Trump's immunity claim was rejected. So we might even conceivably have a convicted criminal on the stage accepting the Republican nomination versus who? Somebody who even the most loyal Biden Democrats are now starting to fear might not get through the end of this term. And that is a major headache when America, 70% of America, American voters, are saying they don't really want either Trump or Biden at the top of the ballot. That is their choice in 2024. Will something shift now? What would be tragic for Biden? I mean, it would be tragic for the American Republic in all sorts of ways and tragic for the world. So in some ways, Biden's own kind of historical legacies and reputation is, is by the by. But... If we got to a situation where Biden, who did perform an enormous service both to his country and to the wider world in removing Trump and getting rid of Trump, if it were to be the case that, to be honest, maybe out of a sense of his own vanity that he wants to be a two-term president, maybe a misguided sense that he remains the only guy who can beat Trump, if he tries to secure that second term and loses because the American public just don't think that it is, he is cognitively capable of being president until he's 86, he will sully what is actually a pretty good domestic record, an impressive domestic record, and, as I say, a service in removing Trump in the first place. We will be back tomorrow with more, and perhaps even more voice. Well, let's hope so. Pray for Emily. Bye for now. Bye. The News Agents. This is a Global Player original podcast. 